wasn't being um, supported in that respect by South Dakota's DENR and also by Iowa's DENR. So uh, in the past oh, two weeks, we've um, had a phone conversation with Iowa's DNR. Um, they met, uh, two people met with us, and they were in charge of Iowa's lake restoration program, uh, which is fairly formalized, and uh, they have some success with their program. It's, uh, they have $8 million a year they, uh, they use to uh, uh, improve their lake situations. Uh, they're, they're somewhat limited on what they'll tackle, but they, they you know, they're, they're, they use good discretion on how they spend their money, and they're, you know, they're positively impacting a number of lakes in Iowa. And they do use dredging as one of their uh, strategies. Uh, maybe not exactly the way we were talking about it. They probably use it more for uh, uh, removing sediment and increasing capacity whereas we've been talking more about it as uh, uh, removing the phosphorus-laden sediment in the lake, just getting it out of the river. So I, I guess, you know, both uh, Mark and Mike have been deeply involved with us. If there's other comments you'd like to make about the Iowa discussion. Not really, except that they do have projects and they have them going. They say after a while, uh, it is true that um, for what they're doing it for, sediment removing, that you know it does get past diminishing returns. Um, but he says we still have projects, we're still going, and and like you said, they were talking about particle size and things like that, which is stuff that we don't we don't get into. So. Um, Just to be clear, uh, when we're talking about sediment removal in Iowa, they're talking about creating more depth in their lakes and ponds. Um, and a secondary benefit is the reduction of phosphorus that occurs with that sediment removal. So their primary is depth, um, but their secondary is, is the removal of, of nutrients in, in the form of phosphorus. Um, a little bit different than what we're looking at here. They also deal with a lot. Uh, lakes that don't exceed probably 200 parts per billion just to make their money go as far as possible. So, um, you know, they don't ha have quite as big of an issue as we have here in Lake Mitchell. Yeah, he said most of the lakes that they had done were between 1 and 200 um, phosphorus parts per billion. So um, that made a – when I told him that ours was 800, and he, he went, wow. You know, and then we told him the size of our watershed, and he was talking about certain lakes and – we're 500 to 1, and they're like 40 to 1. Yeah. And so that just, uh, the one thing I've learned is no two lakes are the same. And they were talking about shallow lakes, and I said, ours is a shallow lake too. Um, he says, I says, about 13 feet is about the mean average. And he goes, well, we're talking 3 to 4 foot deep. So that's, that's a completely different uh, thing. They have wind. It, ours, there's a lot of theirs are big round lakes. Well, they get more wind uh, action on those than we get on ours because ours is a long, narrow. Ours is more of an impoundment, so it's a long, narrow lake. So um, there, there were just differences in how they, they do theirs. But they're still using dredging. So. And the one thing that we, when we were visiting with them, we pointed out we were considering mechanical dredging. And uh, as because it was our, our belief that uh, mechanical dredging, you know, offered greater efficiency and uh, just, you know, just to be more effective uh, getting to all of the locations you need to get to to get it out. Uh, and he asked why we didn't do hydraulic and we explained some of the things and he says, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. He says, I think you need to keep hydraulic on the table and so uh, I thought that was interesting. We had a discussion so, and we've never taken it off the table. Uh, but we just haven't talked about that much. So I, you know, to me, there's other things that uh, we learned from them that I found very beneficial. And Mike, thank you for arranging that. Uh, then we uh, 
visited with, uh, uh, we didn't, Mike met with South Dakota's DENR, and maybe you can take us through that, Mike, if you would. Um, there had been some discussion that DENR was uh, against dredging, and so I thought I had to go to a con transportation meeting on Thursday. I just called up and, and asked the, if I could get a meeting with the secretary and uh, his lake people just to get an idea where DENR was, was really at on dredging. And um, uh, they set it up. Uh, so I met with them uh, was a week ago Wednesday and um, met with six people. I, I, I didn't realize I thought it was going to be me against the, me and the, the secretary and one other person, but I ended up one against six. So it's not against, but um, it was an interesting discussion. Bottom line was uh, they're not against dredging. Uh, they just don't have any money for it. Uh, the difference between uh, South Dakota and Iowa, because I brought that up, is that Iowa, when the 314 program ended, uh, Iowa decided to put some general appropriations money into uh, some lake work, and it's about eight and a half million dollars is what they do and been doing lately. South Dakota didn't. I mean, that's, uh, I, and I asked because I wondered if they funded it through some type of fees or whatever, but it's just general appropriation. And um, so in South Dakota, um, the only money that the state would have is money that comes from the EPA and it's through the 319 program. It's about $2.6 million and that's got to be for the whole state. And that comes generally through your James River Water Development District and your East River and all those uh, other development districts. That's what that gets spread between $2.6 million. So what they were explaining to me was since they couldn't do a whole lot of other things, they take that $2.6 million and they work with NRCS to leverage those funds to do conservation practices upstream because they figure with those two working together, they can better utilize what money, what small amount of money they have, they can leverage each other's money. So that was the reason that they, uh, they were again, that, that, that they don't participate in, in dredging activities. Um, and where some of negative things could have come from is um, one, the state did own dredges back in the 80s. I think we had three of them. Um, Janklo, uh, Governor Janklo um, had bought them. Um, part of the project was to try and straighten out the, the Jim River and I think that, that became a pretty expensive project and they decided to sell them at some point. Um, and so I think, uh, but they're not against it because I asked them, what are you going to do with the 47% that's in there? And they said, we're, we don't, we're, we're not against dredging. We just, we just don't have any money for it. And um, so after the meeting was over, I had a kind of a, just a quick talk with the secretary. I said, well, what, what are we going to do? He says, you know, I mean, that, that's fine that we got, do you have any suggestions what we do with that 47% that's affecting us in the, the lake? And he says, you know, that's a tough, tough deal. And he went into some other things like mercury that they're having problems with. And, and I, we had some prior visits uh, about some of those things when I was in the legislature. So anyway, uh, the next day when I'm walking into the transportation uh, building, I'm met by uh, one of the gentlemen that was in the meeting. And he says, say, he says, the secretary and I have been talking. And he says, what we will do, he says, we will, um, in our plan that we file with EPA, we will make dredging as, as part of the possible plan. He says, now, don't get excited. He says, that we're not going to have any, any money, any grant money for you. He says, that $2.6 million, you're not going to get any of that. But he says, what it does do, he says, is that if, if, if that's in the plan, that makes you then available for low interest SRF funds. And that, that, that is like 2% for 10 years, 2 and a quarter for 20, and 2 and a half for 30 years. So that, you know, he says, now that, that means it's available to apply for. I want to make sure you understand that. That doesn't mean that they're, they're ready to give it out, but it means that you can, you can apply for those funds. I also have asked if that would be available for retention fund, because that's something else we're going to have to do, and that's going to be in expense then. He said there, and I talked to him today, and they're still looking at that to see if that would um, uh, money would that loan money would be available for that. And they also made clear that that's what that loan money is today. The Fed raised 
money, uh, uh, interest rates, it, it, it will also go up. But that's probably about half the cost of what we would if we had to go into the bond market. So it, what it did, it showed me two things. One, that um, they were trying to help us, and two, that they're, they're, they're not against stretching because they wouldn't make uh, loan funds available if they thought it, it, it wasn't something that we could viably use in, in an engineered plan. So I think that's about Yeah, uh, that's great. Uh, th what made it clear, though, is the uh, information we would received earlier about uh, the two states, South Dakota and Iowa, not thinking dredging was appropriate, uh, just wasn't the case. And, uh, and we got that from both states. Uh, so that, we thought, okay, that's good news, but then we thought we need to make sure that uh, this is understood. And so, and I think, was it today, the, uh, uh, was that the uh, public uh, session with the four mayoral candidates at Thursday? Uh, so anyway, we thought they should know these uh, results from our conversation before they have their public and so we met with each of the four mayoral candidates, and we explained basically what we just explained here. So they also understand, or they know what we know. Uh, they they can draw their own conclusions, but at least, you know, I, I think there was misinformation out there, and uh, it should be corrected now. Anyway, uh, two percent money is uh, better than you know, certainly better than what we were looking at before, where it was no money. Perhaps there's some funding possibilities to work from that. And Mr. Chair, I asked him today, when will that be effective? And he says they put it in uh, the day after I uh, had that meeting or that morning. And he says so it's effective now. So it's done. So so we can we can apply for it. So. That's good. That's excellent. Okay. Um, just uh, one other thing. Uh, June 9 uh, from our committee. We have the fish cities, the fish structure that's going to be going on the lake. There's two sets of structure. Uh, fisheries will be in town to help us. Actually, they'll direct us. And then uh, we have volunteers from a couple of local groups and some individuals, and then also the Boy Scouts will be participating. So that'll be a, a good outing tonight. So if you bring a cordless drill and a Yourself, if you want to help out, we'll be meeting at the uh, Sportsman's Club boat ramp at 9 o'clock. So, I guess just for our, our business that we needed to clean up, that pretty much wraps that up. But Mike's here now. So. Yeah, floor's yours. Okay, uh, I didn't know if I was here. To I, I didn't come prepared to present anything, but here to answer any questions. Uh, so uh, we can give you a, I can, what I can do is start off with maybe an update of where we're at. I would like to. Um, that would and be then, great. Uh, why don't we start with that, and then we can, if you want to work through some of the questions that we collectively put together. So where we're at right now in terms of the, the, the second phase of the contract is is the, the, the contract that the city had with Virax with Greg to do the uh, um, phosphorus extraction, sequential extraction, the, the, the results are in. Um, so we got an interesting mix of uh, the, the additional information of the ferrous, the ferric, and the calcium bound phosphorus, what that means to our project. And so we have the answers now. Um, there were the, the, really the, the the information varied um, with what part of the lake um, the samples were taken from. And, and that's a function of the fact that as if, if you think about how when sediment enters a lake, you know, the heavier particles drop out first and the finer particles make it down, you know, closer to the dam. And so that's kind of the nature of sediment deposition. And because of the nature of the different types of sediments, you got different chemical makeups of the different particles that are in those different particle sizes or weight classes of sediment deposition. And so we found that the, the, you know, some of the trends just kind of switch as you go through the lake. What that means is that there probably isn't a consistent band-aid approach across it. So what we do with the information we're still working on right now, I got, a, I got an update from Greg today. Um, one of the things Greg talked about was you know, what he's working on right now, what Greg's focused on right now is, is that portion of uh, if we cap any sediments. And so we're really looking at you know, 
couple solutions right now hard, which is you know, what's the value, the pros and the cons of hydraulic dredging? I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. What's the pros and, and the cons of mechanical dredging? And then what's the pros and the cons of removing everything versus trying to either cap something in place in a mechanical situation, which would be tougher to do with hydraulic but not impossible, uh, or to, to bind the, the, the information with uh, some product. And so well, one of the things we've been doing is crawling around. We talked to Mitchell and South Sioux Falls and, uh, and looking at different chemicals. Uh, alum and bauxite are two of the, the chemicals that could be uh, put into um, uh, a liner. Uh, and, and what we and our cap, and so what we would need to, what I'm thinking in that situation is is we would basically go in and dredge things from the from the codes, and, and the reason I say that is that you know we've got we've got thicker sediment deposition in the in the in the old channel, uh, everything tends to go down and fall down into the deeper spots as as, you, as things constantly get suspended by wind and boating, so we've got thick sediment deposition up to seven foot in, in some of the old channel area, we've got it as small as six foot to an inch or six foot six inches to a foot in some of the, the near shoreline cove type areas. And that's basically because you got shallower water and so big boats come through re, re suspend stuff. And eventually over time everything kind of gets to the deeper spots. Um, and so one of the things we have to think about is that by nature of the and this is we're working on an internal load control project. And so if you think about it, what it isn't necessarily the depth of the sediment that we care about as much as the surface area. So if we can if we can reduce the surface area of the bad sediment down, we can reduce proportionally what the um, what the, the rate is at which that phosphorus can be released in from the, the lake bed. And so that's that's why that capping may make sense. Uh, you know, if we go out and we dredge, let's say we can dredge 80% of the lake, real simply, you know, with, with shallow uh, dredging and uh, and, and, and we moving less than a foot or something, you know, getting into the deeper stuff where, A, the water's still going to travel through the lake, et cetera, getting into some of that deeper stuff that's in that old channel valley there is going to be more difficult to get to, as I'm sure everybody understands. So that's why I think some of that deeper stuff is kind of more of a, of a candidate, call it if you will, for, for capping. So Greg is right now working on a solution related to if we did that, how would that work? So the Sorry, cap when you, excuse me, when you say deeper, you mean deeper sediment. It's all it's all surface area. Um, now, the deeper you get, the more prone it is to anoxic conditions, which releases phosphorus faster, faster from the, the soft sediments. Um, but it's still, the lake is shallow. You know, compared to Nebraska, this is a pretty deep lake actually. But uh, it's still considered a shallow lake, and so that there is a lot of turnover. And we don't we don't anticipate there are very many anox severe anoxic conditions going on. Although some, because we did see the. the Sentiment samples. So we are looking at, so, so Greg's working on that. We're working on uh, mechanical and, and hydraulic dredging and dealing with the issues that come with each. And so I'm just going to kind of spit all a bunch of stuff that we're thinking about here. You know, when we talk about mechanical dredging, what I like about it is that we can visibly see that we're getting the sediment out. Uh, we can go down there, we can drain the lake, we can go down there, do dredging, we can see that we've got the soft sediment out. There's going to be a visible demarcation in the darker blacker soft sediments than there is in, in the original brown. So, and, and just in the, in the consistency of the, uh, of the material, you could walk across there with boots and put yourself squish through until you hit, you know, a hard pit. So, that's what I like the most about it is we know we get it. In hydraulic dredging, you rely 100% on electronic equipment, you know, mostly sonars, to say we're getting down into this. And then you rely a lot on the, on the feel of the dredger who runs the cutter head they're very good. They know when they're getting into different materials by the resistance of the dredge and the, and the rate at which it removes the material. But ultimately, we would be relying on that. We would be relying on them to say, yeah, we got it. Um, if, if the lake is drained, I can, I can tell you, yeah. You can tell you, yeah, we, we got it all. So that, that's one of the biggest things about the, the hydraulic dredging that I like. The other thing, or, or the, sorry, the mechanical. So the other thing about the mechanical that I like the best is, is that when we're done with the project, as we stated, the goal is to leave the project, you know, right now is to get us, buy us some time before we can work on the entire project. We're just talking about this internal load control phase. We're trying to get to the point where we can live with the lake for a while while we try to wrap up the rest of this project. And so we 
have said, you know, get it back to 1927 conditions. In 1927, there was still internal loading. We know we have high phosphorus soils in the watershed. We know we have, we have naturally occurring high phosphorus soils underneath the lake as they exist today. So, so by nature of, the, of that, we know that even if we just went dredged and, and got the old original lake bed down there, we're still going to have internal loading. But in a mechanical <coughs> situation, one of the things we can do is we can apply a sequestering agent like dry alum, which is what your grandma used to pickle pickles. Um, you know, we can we can apply that at a very very inexpensive rate. It's going to really lock in and keep those existing soils from from leaching phosphorus as the lake fills back up. Um, that's important because it buys us some time. Um, and so, actually, my goal would be that in, at the end of a mechanical dredging project, the lake is in better shape than it was in 1927 because you don't have as high of a rate, a, a rate, and you could really get it down very low of, of coming in. The problem with that is, is that as we just saw, and I know you're all, I think almost everybody that's boarded an email about the post flooding uh, tests we did. So what we know is that. When we, there, there was kind of two, you saw in the hydrograph, there was kind of two peaks yeah. on that. And, and so the, the lake was tested at that second peak. The lake was tested at that second peak. And at that time, there had been, in looking at the gauge upstream, uh, so it was testing at a 4, I guess a 14, 3, 4.4, whatever it was. So at that time, the, lake, the, the volume in the runoff hydrograph up to that date from that spring storm, had sent enough water down, we replaced the lake five times. And so the lake turned over five times just in a runoff that was there. So what we know is that with, with the mixing that occurred, internal loading into that particular concentration was pretty, probably pretty low. Um, it's not zero, uh, but at the rate at which phosphorus is released, you know, for those couple of weeks and the lake being flushed five times, 90, 95% of that concentration, that 560 part per billion, is attributable to just the watershed. And so we know that even if we got internal loading down to zero, if it was zero, which is impossible, but if it was zero, we know if you got a runoff event, we're going to be stuck with at least 500 parts per billion in the lake without doing anything else to that water. And so if you recall, um, at, when, when we talked about at the end of the TM, we talked about, you know, the possibility of doing a maintenance whole lake alum treatment after Memorial Day. Um, you know, that would allow, that, that's generally when the, historically the rain subside, the water's going to run out of the watershed. We could go in there and treat the lake, and you can get the lake where it's going to be, you know, in better condition than probably any of you have ever seen in your life. Um, the problem is, if it rains four days later and you get a two inch runoff, you're probably, you're probably back to 560 parts per million. Uh, and so, we're going to be dealing with that phenomenon from here on out. And so I want to make, I want to be very clear that at the end of any internal load control project, no matter how we do it, even if we get the internal load control down to zero, we're still going to be stuck with this dynamic of how to do this. And, and, and that management scenario is going to be, you know, you're going to have to decide on what you want to do. Now, if that means that that's a, don't quote me on this, but if that means that that's a $150,000 Allen treatment you're going to do the Memorial Day, to get the lake in the recreation season, you know, uh, to, to get it down to the rates we talked about we'd like to have it down to, which is 60 to 80, then, then that's what's going to have to happen. Okay? Down the road, if we looked at the detention cell, the bypass, the, those are some of the other tools we can help to manipulate that phenomenon. And, and that's ultimately what we have to get to, and that would be the next, the next step. And, and that's part of what we had talked about in the original larger next phase until we pared it down to just nail down dredging costs. So th this was good information and, and good re re reaffirmation of what the model was already telling us, which was we got to make sure we're, we're very mindful of that. So the, the, those are two biggest pros of the, of the mechanical dredging contract is, is that A, we could visibly see that we got the soft sediments. B, we, we could incorporate uh, capping as a, another potential part of the solution, uh, and that actually C is that we could um, apply stuff very inexpensively um, to, to really nail down and, and reduce that internal loading control to as minimal as, as we possibly can. The challenges of mechanical dredging come with, you know, what do we do with poet's water? Um, what do we do with people's seawalls and, and, and shoreline protection areas? Um, you know, what
what do we do when we drain the lake and then it rains? Um, there, there's a lot of challenges that are out there uh, that are going to need to be part of this thing. And, and we're looking at different solutions like zoning the lake uh, and, and other things that we could possibly do to um, uh, mitigate some of those challenges. But, but they all come with a risk or a cost. And, and so that, that's what we're really working on there. The, the hydraulic dredging answers a lot of those challenges that we have, but, but it doesn't allow us to do those three things that I really like the benefits of the mechanical dredging project do. We can't visibly see that all the stuff got taken care of, but we can get into those deeper area areas a little bit better. Um, we, we can't apply, the, 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 we can apply liquid alum, but we can't apply uh, the, the dry alum at a, at a easier rate to there, so we can't visibly see they're gone. We can't do the alum, and then the last one is, is the, uh, the capping. We, we, we lose that ability if we do a hydraulic dredging project. And so, but a lot of the headaches go away. We don't have to worry about flooding. We don't have to worry about mullet. We don't have to worry about some of the other challenges that come with mechanical dredging. So that's what I'm doing right now. It, it feels kind of like we're juggling 12 balls and trying to lay things out in a way where it kind of makes sense and we can come up with a number uh, that's reasonable. Um, on the schedule, uh, I've been working with Mark, who's lined up uh, a lot of local technical professionals. I'm coming back up on uh, May 24th, and we're going to sit down in his office, and um, I'm going to come with everybody prepared for the meeting. And we're, we're going to probably try to handle three of the four biggest things, you know, disposal areas, dealing with public water, how do we manage water during the project. We're going to try to get, you know, pick some of the brands of the local professionals and say, you know, what, what are the resources we have in town here uh, to do that. Um, I had lunch with Steve Rice today, and, we're, and, and you know, one of the questions he asked is, you know, what, one of the things we want to know is, can we really do this? You can do anything. You know, I, I'm of the opinion, and, and we've probably proven across the world uh, with different technologies, we can do anything we set our minds to. The question is, what does it cost? Um, and, and so that's what we're going through right now is, is, is putting a good cost to all those things ultimately but so that we can hopefully come up with a project that's palatable to, to everybody. So that's the 24th. Our plan is to be back June 18th. Uh, present the findings, hopefully get this to you at least a couple days ahead of time um, so that you, you see the, the, the findings of this uh, effort uh, and that, uh, you know, and then it's time to figure out what, what the next step is. So that's where we're at today. Happy to take any questions. Mike, I got a question real quick because you had commented on the dry alum. So after you mechanically dredge and you're applying dry alum, can you tell them how, how you apply it and how long that, that lasts for the internal loading problem? So it, it's just a powder you know, that you would disc in. You would just, once you get the ground in, you shove off the soft sediments. You've got a hard pan left that you just lay it on the ground and disc it in. It's just a, a, a powder. Um, you know, liquid alum gets mixed in and, and, and has a buffering agent, et cetera. And so how long would it last? How much you want to apply? Uh, you know, so that, that's, it's just, it's the same as liquid alum. It lasts longer, but you don't have to worry about why. Could you mention the cost of that as well? Uh, I've just been told, so we're working on that right now to see what it takes to get it here. So, so Mitchell doesn't use alum in their in their water treatment because you can get water from other people. They don't use it in the wastewater process. Sioux Falls does, and so we got some costs from Sioux Falls. Uh, oh no, Sioux Falls does not. Sioux City does, and, and so we got costs from Sioux City and Omaha uh, on how to get that there. Now we just got to figure out how much it costs to get here. So I, that's coming. I think it was literally there was email traffic today. On So, so alum, so, so liquid alum and, and, and dry alum are the same. The, the aluminum is what bonds the, the phosphorus. And so the more there is, the more phosphorus that can be bonded. And so the more you place, the more it takes the phosphorus that's coming up from the lake. The, the, one of the benefits of that over liquid alum is that we can disc it in place it doesn't move around. And so liquid alum floats through, creates a flock when it's mixed in two parts. And it, it's like a, a, a frothy blanket that sinks through the lake that strips the water column all the way down. This would just be protecting against the inner load from things coming up from the bottom. So the more we place, the, the more it lasts. Does that phosphorus settle down and then it tags it up, or does phosphorus not settle down? Phosphorus is always being remixed within the water column. And, and so whatever comes in contact with the bottom, so, so the, the top layer is, is the first part that's going to get bound up. So it's really not. The dry alum application after mechanical is really not going to do anything, virtually nothing, to 
a big lake boss or some water. Same, same thing, liquid alum, once you place it, it does a better job because it, it strips the water column. But if you still have excess alum in the block that rests on the bottom of the lake, when that gets resuspended, it strips the water column again. So there's an advantage to that. But it's limited, it's, it limits, that limits how much the liquid alum in a whole lake application it would limit how much could be it control the internal load by how much flock is sitting on top of that area. And so there's, like everything else, there's a pros and cons to each approach. Is it cheaper to apply for a product? It's a cheaper product. It's yeah. cheaper to apply, yes. Mark? Mike, I know we've kind of talked about this in the past, but are you looking at at all a combination of the two of, of mechanical and hydraulic dredging? Um, or is it more just one or the other? No, nope, that's a good question. I should have, I should have said it right up front. Yeah, you know, there's, so I, I start thinking of things like, okay, if we start out on a mechanical dredging project, and one of the things we're doing, and, and SBN did a good study years ago about using siphons and the other, the other uh, facilities that are in place to drain down the lake, and so we've got a lot of good information from that study. Um, what we're looking at then is, okay, so what's the risk? And, and so we're looking at, okay, what is a, what is a, a half year, a one year, a two year, five year, ten year storm in a watershed, how much water does that bring down through Mitchell? What does it take to fill it? And, and what's, and what's the, the, the frequency? And what's the likelihood that, that you're going to get that during that construction period of late fall, you know, to, to through the winter months when you feel that that would be the best time to do a mechanical dredging project? Um, you know, so just thinking out loud, Mark, I could, I could see one contingency plan being, okay, we're going to, we're going to mechanically dredge the coves and from the from the shoreline down, but at some point there may be a point where we say um, it makes sense just to have a combination of mechanical and hydraulic dredging going on there. If we can focus, like I said, on that big surface area of that zero to seven foot depth, let's just say we're going to mechanically dredge from zero to seven foot depth, and then we're going to hydraulically dredge everything below that, or, or be prepared to. If we get lucky and there's no rainfall, we don't have water coming through our job site, um, and, and we could do it more mechanically, then great. Um, but I, I, my guess is that looking at all the risks, it, it given the, the a short construction time period of trying to achieve this in one off season, that a combination of mechanical and, and hydraulic dredging may make sense. And I kind of asked that just from the standpoint that that old canal holds a fair amount of water, and when we're talking about the questions about poet and um, having water for them as well as um, any flushes that come down during those fall time period, um, that there's still water in that old canal potentially, though I know that's where the most amount of sediment is also that needs to get removed. So that transition between allowing that canal to have water in it maybe when it doesn't, I think that's the big question. That's yep. the answer. Right. And, and, and along with that, you know, we're, we're also looking at the possibility of phasing the lake, so so we could leave you know water around uh, one way or the other that could be uh, you know a cove and, and, and is that could we get enough volume there have hope be able to take that and maybe just move into the next cove for a short period of time or something so that's also being considered as a, as a potential option. Is there any questions back here that Mike is on the board? I can move. Why don't I? So uh, I'll ask you one while you're walking. Um, if if we use capping, um, you know, bauxite, uh, alum, uh, do you use them together? So, so or one or the other? There are reasons why uh, the, the gypsum has some lesser effects. So there are other materials being considered as well. Uh, and Greg is go going through those as well, and, and we'll talk about those. Okay. Uh, uh, those two particular materials, I, I kind of see them working them, putting a clay layer down, disking that into a center part of the cap or something, then put some more clay on top. So th that's what we're working on right now. How about, now. Uh, if you do that, what about natural vegetation? Uh, does it still function okay in the cap material, or is that uh, going to be 
So the cap material is probably going to be at an at, at area that's a big enough, low enough depth, Joe, that we wouldn't expect there to get a whole lot of emergent, submergent vegetation in that area. Okay. If that was, let, let's just say the cap was only for materials that were 15 feet or deeper. Okay. Then we would probably. Right. I understand that. Um, and the other question I had, uh, some type of a cost comparison between mechanical and hydraulic, you know, uh, help us out with our decision. Would, it, would that be part of uh, what you present in June, or would that be? Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. So, and, and, and the, you know, the, the biggest factors are, well, the biggest factor is, is where we put. How much is it and where we put? Yeah. Um, another thing that worries me a little bit about a hydraulic dredging is that, you know, you, you move, basically you move clay and soft silts at, at about an 18% slurry. So when you're pumping that, you got about 18% solids and the rest is water. Well, you know, we see Mitchell already, the, the lake goes up and down and, and, and is a little bit hungry for water sometimes. And so if we think about if we're going to move, let's say, a million cubic yards of material, that means we're probably pumping 8 million yards of water. And so we got to think about what that does to the lake budget, uh, you know, uh, at, at the time. So even hydraulic dredging, if we don't return the water, you got to figure out where you're going to process it to separate the material so that you're not hauling, hauling. We don't want you know, it's like anything else. You, we don't want to haul water uh, or any ubiquitous material. So, so the idea is how do we get it as sure. free as possible um, to start. So, yeah, so all those things we're going to factor in. One of the one of the things I want to talk about tonight from you, get from you is to talk a little bit about dredge disposal decision making because it has a huge impact on price. While we're talking about capping, I'm just going to piggyback on that. When I've talked to some people about the, they, they've gone in and they've commercially um, taken out the rough fish at the bottom feeders. How long does capping last? I mean, is that is that functional for forever type thing? Uh, you get more sediment on top of it, obviously, as as time goes on. But uh, it, or do the the rough fish down there screw up the the capping? Or is that tight enough so that you don't have all of a sudden the, the phosphorus that you covered up, it's now, you know, they brushed aside the bauxite or the clay or whatever it is, and we're back to phosphorus. And it's a great question, Mike. And I, and I think, uh, you know, what I envision having material and then a mixed chemical clay material and then more clay on top of that. That's what I'm envisioning right now. Uh, and. Greg is, like I say, he's working on that right now. That, that's going to be considered. I would think that you would want to put that material down into the middle, at least, of the cap so that that wasn't a problem. Um, you know, you're, even if we build it and, and we put things, if we put things in place and we compact things to 95% maximum density, you know, in the bottom of the lake, if that's even possible. How do you pack it, though, if it's in the channel? Well, so, so generally what happens is, is you, you, you build a base. Uh, whether that means you pile in sand until you get something you can drive on, and you keep moving material until you can drive on it. And once you can drive on it, you know, th then we can go. Once you get equipment, then we can go. So you, you, the bottom of it might be squishy, but the goal is to get the top, uh, you know, something there. So, you know, just like when you're building a concrete structure in a mud hole, you just keep putting down a rock until you have something you can stand on, right? So I don't know how well we can drive that out, Mike, and there's other there's other admixtures, et cetera, and that's some of the stuff we're going to be brainstorming now. You know, sometimes it's, it's like building a, you know, you, you see these contractors build sand, sand roads out to build bridges in the middle of rivers, and sometimes you just keep pushing material until it takes. For that capping, are you use, using just clay, or are you using a special clay like bentonite or something like that? So, Obviously, we want to maximize naturally occurring materials that are easy to get to close, and, and so that's part of what's being considered right now is how, how, how would we minimize any you know, imported materials that have to go into the cap aside from the plant itself. A local, you know, th this is going back to our discussion before, you get a local hillside and stealing clay from it and, and putting, you know, dredge spoils back in it is something that it sounds like it would make some sense. But here's the other thing to remember, folks, is that we're talking about trying to do this stuff from fall to through winter. And compacting clay in the winter is pretty difficult. And so that's something else that has to be considered. However, driving on frozen muck in the winter is a little easier. So I think there's parts about winter construction that are going to help you and parts that are going to hurt you. 
You know, if we were we, we couldn't build a highway, that doesn't mean we can't get. You know, if we if we can get the clay in place, you know, unfrozen, and and let it freeze, and then just keep adding on to it. I don't know if that is going to achieve what we want, and that may allow us to drive over a frozen block. So was the capping in the area that's in the channel, or is that anywhere possible? It's possible anywhere, as I stated before, I, my, my vision for it now is it's only going to make sense where it's deep. Most of the volume of the material, over half the volume of material, is in probably 10% of the surface area of the lake. Don't quote those numbers, but you know, if you just looked at the channel going through the lake, if that's only 10% of the surface area of the lake, then we've got over half the, so it's kind of the 80-20 rule, we've got most of the material down in there. So if we can minimize the extent of the capping, Otherwise, you just get it all out. And that's only an option if we use mechanical drilling. That, yes. There, there are ways, you know, the, the Dutch have some very interesting technologies that they use to raise the, the, the wetlands on the, on the seashore. And, and, you know, you could look at some of that stuff. I, I just know it's, it's just, we looked at that technology for Lake Manawa, actually, and uh, it, it's, it's expensive. That part, the the uh, channel of the lake is also the deepest part of the lake. So you talked about maybe not draining the entire lake. I guess that pretty much means, though, you do need to drain the entire lake if you're going to cap the deepest part of the lake. Correct? Um, I think we would want to probably. I'm thinking we probably need to at least get the, the the water off of it. And so if you know pumping that out and draining it and getting it down to at least a point where it could freeze, uh, you know, at least get it down to the muck uh, is what I'm envisioning. Uh, one of the and one of the things that the fishermen may not necessarily like about the capping is, is that we've just taken a whole lot of depth diversity out of the lake. And, and from a fish management standpoint, a fish habitat standpoint, that's probably a no-no. Um, you know, you want depth diversity, you want structure, as Joe was talking about before. Um, you know, we, we, can, we can make up for a lack of depth diversity with some additional work in terms of adding structure to the lake. But that's one thing if we cap the entire old channel area, because there is a defined depression there still now. That, that allows some depth diversity for the fish, but if we capped it all and just made it the same elevation as the floodplain, then we, we just eliminate all the deeper parts of the lake too. Not to say we couldn't go and dig some holes up in the coves pretty easy if we did mechanical dredging. There's there's ways of mitigating it, but that's just one of the other balls that's juggling as we try to figure out the right solution. There was a video recently, I don't know if you already saw it, but there's a, a young man, he's probably 11 years old on a on a Japanese game show, and he's juggling three Rubik's cubes, and he solved all three of them, you know, while he was juggling them. And it, it, it feels like that sometimes because every time you twist something, another color comes up, and, you know. And those, those are all the things that we're trying to think of and bring together. But to get back to your point, Brian, that's where he talked a little bit about earlier in sectioning off lakes. So, you know, maybe you have it full at one point in time in the process, but then you section off the lake, still have water somewhere else. And then you go and you put the water into the canal. Is that that that's true. The, the, the lowest part's always gonna be the toughest part because that's where all the runoff's gonna want to run. Um, so dealing with that, that that's the trickiest. Dredging the coves isn't tricky. You know, that, that, that's the area that's gonna be high and dry the most and, and doesn't have to worry about localized drainage. Every time something rains in the watershed, we know where the water's coming. In my mind, there's always going to be a channel, though. When you've got these huge runoffs, you're always going to have a channel. That water's going to create a channel. So somehow you have to maintain that as you cap it, you know, understanding that that's where that water wants to go. So And even if the cap wasn't flat and the, and the cap was sort of, you know, a bowl-shaped, a, a U, or let, let's just call it a swale, um, yeah. There's got, the handling of the water is one of the trickiest parts on any dredging, mechanical dredging project, it's a reservoir, and, and that's why. Um, because you've got to deal with runoff at, at all times. Um, the, uh, and, and, and the size of the watershed compared to the lake is just adds to that complexity here. This is a little bit different topic, but um, going more towards the holding pond portion of things, um, I just need to understand it better in my head. But we have a 
water soluble or uh, water soluble phosphorus issue. With a holding pond, does that phosphorus then eventually settle down? Is that the, the basis, and, and therefore the vegetation that's in that holding pond consume that phosphorus there? Is that the idea behind the holding pond? Or just explain that a little bit more so I can understand that better in my head. So so the, we, we have, we'll just call them soluble phosphorus and sediment attached phosphorus. So the sediment attached phosphorus will eventually settle out because it's attached to a particle. The soluble phosphorus is just part of the water chemistry and it isn't going to go anywhere. It's always going to be mixed. And, and, and I think, you know, we're, we're guessing we're at somewhere at two-thirds soluble, one-third sediment attached. So we can use, so, so we can use mechanical means and, and, and settlement, plan settlement to get sediment attached phosphorus to settle out. The soluble phosphorus, we would want to, wet, wetland plants, for instance, do two things. They'll, they'll mechanically screen sediment attached phosphorus, but they will also use more readily soluble phosphorus to help grow. And so an, an appropriate aquatic vegetation growing plan and sediment removal maintenance plan would be part of what that is. More importantly to that, and, and, and I talked to Steve Rice today about this, is, is that one of the things that we had planned in, in the original next phase, uh, phase that, that we're not doing now since we're just focused on the dredging cost is, you know, this that hydrograph that you saw here coming off the watershed. One of the things we want to know, and, and we talked about scoping this, is, is putting in some, some uh, phosphorus uh, meters, uh, automatic samplers, in the watershed so that one of the questions is, is as we get a, a runoff, you know, in the city, we, you've always heard with, with regard to stormwater, you heard about the, the, the water quality and, and the, what they call the initial flush. And so that's why in, in, in water quality uh, work in the city, they always say, let's capture that first half inch of runoff. That's where all the pollutants are. One of the things we want to understand in this watershed is, is that is that 560 parts per billion that we know comes down, is it 1,000 in the front and 200 in the back? Or is it equal throughout the whole thing? We don't have that answer right now. It's so what we want to do. It's got some of that testing done to figure out, is it front end loaded? Is it equally mixed? Because that'll also help us design what the, and what portion soluble and what portion is sediment attached. Because that's going to help us figure out and really tweak the design of what that is. That can make a pretty major impact then on that 500 parts per billion that we're seeing come down. Absolutely. And so depending on what you find out from those readings, your information about that 500 parts per billion could could decrease pretty significantly depending on the plan that's put forth to deal with the different areas or hot spots that may be available there. Right. Okay. And, and before this meeting, Mayor Toomey and, and Nathan and I were discussing the, the, the bypass that was talked about in the TM. That thing's going to be make or break. You know, I, I think that thing doesn't make sense if, if it's mixed. But but if it is front end loaded and, and there's higher concentrations. It might soon, you know, when you talk about what that might offset as far as, you know, whether you're using alum injection or just relying upon sediment deposition and or uh, nutrient uptake through wetlands later on, it could really help offset the land area needed for those costs. So that, that's another bit of information that. And you can focus your watershed efforts specific to some of those hotspots, yes, right? Yes, sir. So th this is one of those things where we, when we say, you know, studying helps, additional information always helps design. It really shows how it can save money and those things. that Nobody wants to spend the money for those things up front, and, but that, this is how one of those deals where you know, it really could help sell it, save uh, in the long run, you know, what the cost and the effectiveness, based upon the effectiveness of the system. On the flip side, important with the water So we we you know we we've always supported 100% that we need to keep doing everything we can in the watershed. If, if we so we know that you know so far that the rates of implementation in the watershed, you know, have been uh, of practices that are readily available right now, um, has been fairly slow. Now with, with more education and with a bigger uh, campaign to go out and try to actively sell it, can those things improve? Yes, they usually do. Um, but we know right now that you know. We got 560 parts per billion coming out of the watershed. Are we going to get that down to 60? Never. Never. 
we can't have a usable lake just focusing solely on the watershed and ignoring internal load control. So, you know, the city of Mitchell can only control the lake. They can't control and go out to 500, 700 landowners uh, and, and get that work done or even come close to paying for what it would cost. So we know that we have to get this reduced. But we also know that if we got 550 or 560 parts per billion down to 300, I mean, that would be such a monumental success to be celebrated nationwide. It would be incredible for, for watershed work. But it's still, if we still know that we have 300 parts per billion coming down and we have to have it down around 80 to 100 to get the lake to meet the goals we want, we're not going to get there. <laughs> Solely in the watershed. So we've got to keep moving, keep reducing. Everything we do in the watershed that reduces the, the pollutant loading that comes from the watershed reduces the in-lake and the near-lake maintenance costs of the future. You mentioned goals, and do you have some goals from the dredging that could be expected? I, I mean, this part of this 560 is the inflow, but it's also being flushed through. So the goal of dredging would be to lower the average parts per billion of phosphorus in the water. So do we have, the in, if we get the internal control, do we have some goals on how much we could lower the overall phosphorus level? Yes. And so that, that, that will be in the deliverable in terms of what it ends up being, talking about what the, the systems are. What, one, of the things that, one of the other things we need to do is see, is, is right now guess what we go sample later is, even if you got rid of all the soft sediment, what, what's, gonna, what's gonna be leaching off of just the existing hard pan, the existing lake bed material? There's phosphorus in those soils. We know that because it's generating it already. So, so how much is gonna be coming if we did that? But when we put in alum, so, so the bigger question really is the timing of things. Because we know that if we got this thing down to 60 or 80, that if it rained the next day, we could be starting in at 600 again. And so we, we have to start thinking about the seasonality of the management decisions that we make and making the lake usable when we want it to be usable. And so that's part of the goals that we talked about in the TM and that we talked about with, with this committee kind of through the development of the TM is understanding if you remember, there's that chart with the bar chart with the graph through it. That's what we were getting at there, is matching that runoff and, and, and hedging our bets some, is that we got to play a little bit of poker with that in terms of, we talked about it, it may be necessary until you get, until we know that a detention basin or something, or a bypass system could, could be that, and, and watershed loaded get reduced so much that's that effective that we don't have to do an average annual alum treatment, you know, to, to get the lake usable. Until we get to that point, you know, we're not going to know exactly what that is, and we're going to be dealing with more about uh, goals of what they are. And I want to think about the goals in terms of being seasonal. That's correct. I mean, whatever the internal load is contributing, we're looking at reducing that. And at the very start, reducing it significantly. And, and over time, you're just going to lose that as, as more sediment comes in and as whatever we leave in place to help reduce it is there. So as I'm thinking about this, it, say we accomplish that, it, but with that accomplishment, we will see a lake that turns green. Gonna, healthy lakes turn green. Healthy lakes have algae I mean, blooms. To a point yeah. where, you know, if it's got 560 parts per million coming in, and we cleaned out, we, maybe we don't hit, hit 800, but we're going to hit 560. And that's enough to support probably an unhealthy algae bloom. So uh, I guess in my, in my mind, we have to almost have immediately the near lake solution very close at hand. Otherwise, we won't see the improvement in the lake we want to see. If we, I mean, we can do the the work uh, in the lake, get that to where it needs to be. But then we better be ready to get to that next part because you know I don't. You know, we have a couple of green summers, yeah. and uh, and probably you know we're going to have uh, red faces. I mean, I guess it didn't do what we hoped explaining constantly how is this better right and, and so that next that next phase has to be very close at hand and I guess that's
that's what I was wondering. Uh, you know, if we can ever get to a point where there's a final design, uh, is that fairly well described in that final design, that next phase? And near Lake? No. No, we, we, we talked about that, and, and uh, that was removed from, you know, the, the next effort. Um, what you said is 100% correct, Joe, and in fact, Mayor Toomey made the same exact comment to me earlier today. Um, you know, what we're, what we're banking on now is we're understanding this is going to be a multi-year process. We, no one can afford to go out and do everything you want in a year and a half. Um, we, of course, want to try to bring in outside funding sources, et cetera. That's going to take some time. What we're trying to do is buy us a time where we can, A, show good faith towards the city's commitment to restoring the lake, and B, um, buy us time to be able to work on solidifying you know, the values of bringing in the outside grants. What you said is 100% right, Joe. We want to do that as soon as possible. We can do things. You know, what we know is that, and what we've said is that if we went in there and just got all the soft sediment out there as a minimum, theoretically, we got the lake back to where it was when it was built in 1927, right? And supposedly, maybe the expectations are different, but supposedly the lake was usable for multiple decades before there was a problem. And so if we go in there and not only remove the soft sediment, but also leave something in place like dry alum or something, to sequester future internal loading, we're actually in a better spot than we were in 1927. So that's the whole go is buying us some time. Now we still show that anytime there's a rain, we got high concentrations. What you will find is that without some of the loading, et cetera, and, and it's impossible to predict this, but the, 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 the length and, and the, the severeness of the algal blooms are likely to be different. I mean, you know now that they've got worse year after year. We're getting to the point where they're, they're at a tipping point. They weren't always like this. Uh, and so, the, you know, the lakes obviously is worse of a situation it's ever been in. Um, and so even a decade ago, we didn't have the duration. It probably didn't have the toxins. We didn't necessarily measure for it back then, but we didn't have the, you know, the severeness of the blooms. Are we still going to have blooms? Yes. Healthy lakes across everywhere have blooms. But it, it's, it's can we live with the duration and the severity of them? Mike, could you comment on uh, the, the WAC and TAC committees and uh, what they could be working on and, and also understanding that if we're not doing a project this fall, that we have a whole year, another year. I mean, what are, some, what, are, what are some roles of the committees that they can be working on during this time and how can we utilize their efforts? So the, the, we've always gone back to this. So whatever we can do to A, promote, you know, the, the biggest things we can do is promote awareness and education and, and support for the project. Um, watershed, figuring out how to work with the local officials to get into the watershed and do whatever we can to keep that momentum in the watershed and even ramp up the momentum in the watershed for sure. Um, you know, immediately what we could use help with is brainstorming. What, one of the hardest things for me to do, you know, from a desktop is say where, where we have good dredge disposal spots. And that's one of the things that's on my agenda item um, with Mark on the 24th, but um, you know, where's where's some spots where we could potentially put this? Where's some ideas of where we can put this? All I could do is look at an area and say, there's an open space, there's an open space, there's an open space. You all know who owns them. You all know who uses them. You you know if there's reasons you can or cannot use that land. Um, you know, we can we can spread this out. We can pile it, and farmers can spread it on their fields. You know, we're going to address some of that stuff in the in the um, TM as well. So that's something immediately. Um, that we can help with, um, but other than that, I mean, it's we're we're a little on hold, um, you know, in terms of what we can do. That the, the main job of the WAC is to understand the social acceptability of the of the project and and help build consensus for the project. And the main, you know, role of the TAD is to is to help you know vet the project technically um, and, and and use other available technical resources to help implement the project. And so as long as we're continuing to work with those, that, you know, one of the things we, we put the brakes on was that, you know, coordinating with District 3, talking to the state, talking in the watershed, sampling in the watershed, all those things. There's some things that could be being done right now if there's availability and there's willingness on behalf of those committees to do that work. And, and that answer probably isn't going to change for the next year. That's probably, you know, the, the, the best thing we can do. You're, 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 you're about to go through an election cycle, um, and, and there's, you know, and, and talking to, I talked to Steve Rice and Mel Olson today, and, you know, and I understand some of the politics are in town. I understand that 
that there are people out here who don't want me involved in this project anymore. There are people out there who don't want this project, period. And, uh, you know, conveying the, the, the same message and telling the same message to everybody and everybody understanding, you know, what's really going on versus someone's opinion of what's going on um, is probably the best thing you can do through this thing. And then ultimately, everybody's just going to have to regroup when the dust settles and, and figure out what the next steps are. Um, we were on um, talking about the soluble phosphorus and how much phosphorus is coming in. You're saying getting a, a testing to see what's coming down all the time so that we got a, a continual testing of phosphorus. Is, is, is that some type of mechanism that we should be looking at? Uh, I mean, how expensive is, a, is that? Uh, and, and is that something that we would do? Is that something we would hire done? Is that something we could train someone here at, in, in, in Nate's shop to be able to, to do uh, once we got the equipment in, in wherever it is, is at? Right. Um, because there are some, some funds out there through different agencies that we might be able to go in and say, can we, you know, if we purchase this, this is what we can tell is coming down the lake coming down the, the watershed because they they might be, they have a concern about the watershed and we can be testing the watershed. Is, what's the cost of that? Who runs that? How, and how would we do it? So so just so you know, that, that was all scoped out in this task. And that, that, that was the initial, I think, section one of that, the, the larger contract that we talked about. That, that was what all that was, Mike. Um, so what we're talking about is, is a couple things. We, we proposed A, that we do some additional sampling in the watershed to try to help us refine the hot spots a little bit and understand instead of just having one sample place in the watershed you know, for, for that many square miles, instead we say, okay, let's just make sure that what we did, which, which was the basic GIS analysis to identify the hot spots, um, can be verified in the field. Number two, the thing I talked about earlier about sampling a, a couple runoff events is we'd like to know is there higher concentrations at the beginning, the middle, the end, or is it all just equal there. And so we would set up what we call an auto sampler uh, to do that and it basically it's just it's a machine that sits down in the creek and we work with Dr. Mazur and, and the local uh, college to, uh, there are students who are capable of doing that work. You know the, the, the machines aren't necessarily inexpensive. You can rent them, you can buy them. Uh, we laid all that out in there and so we've got all that stuff. Um, we're kind of, we're getting ready to miss that window. Uh, it just wasn't what, it just wasn't what part of the what I understood the city council was interested in doing, you know, when we talked in early April. So don't know that I understood all that. You gotta understand I'm a little slow. That's all right. Um, if we could come up with a, a machine like that, is that that is something though that we could be testing throughout? I mean, yeah, I I, I was asking when we were having all the water going to the spillway, is anybody testing this? In fact I called somebody, can we just go down and you know, you got to do it from the same spot, but I don't know how deep you go. You know, I, I have no idea. I'm, I'm, I'm not that, that's not any of my expertise, but I would like to have us be able to be able to do that and do it on a consistent basis so that we can say, you know, here's what's coming when we have a spring rain. Here's what happens when we have that, you know, 15th of July thunderstorm that drops four inches everywhere in the watershed or whatever it might be or some places in the watershed and comes all down, what, what, what kind of run do we get so it's there ready and, and waiting? Can, can we buy that equipment? Yep. And, and, and like, is it, can you just give me a ballpark of what it would cost? It, it's all tasked out, Mike. That, that's all in that. Yeah, I, I can send it to you tomorrow, the description okay. of what the cost of the machinery is. Yeah, we, we spec all that out for what we were hoping to do this spring. Okay. Yep, that's all already done. There, there is a... The auto samplers are they're a little expensive and could you have students do it yeah but there's there's a safety aspect of getting out there in the middle of storms and that, that I worry about but we, we've worked with Dr. Mazur and others just on, on looking at you know what would they be able to help with and as part of their interest to the students interest in the project or whatever and so we laid that out and basically said here here's what we think needs to happen now let's work with people who are interested in helping and saying how much of this can you shave off by you handling is this something that's permanent in there, or you take it in and out all the time? No, they're they're, they're pretty. They, they move around the auto samplers. You can rent them, you know, or you can you can buy them. It's it's pretty rare. If you have a uh, an industry in town, they probably have some permanent ones where they you know they have a a set reporting. They're both 
I, I'm just wondering, can, can you build it into the, where it, no boats hit it or anything, but it's always there? Yeah, yeah sure. In the water, in the watershed? Yeah, you can do anything. You bet. That's easy. In, in fact, they, instead of doing lake level readings, one of the first things the city did was went and build a, we gave them a spec for those, and they went and built it themselves and, and put the troll in that measured it all, and, and now we get it, you know, constant instead of paying for it. You pay a little more up front, but you got great data. So all that, all that stuff's laid out, Mike. I'd be that, that, that was just a lake level reading. Just so doing a sampler is a little bit different because samples have to be collected and then processed and then sent to the lab, so it's different. All that, that thing is just all you do is plug in a computer and download the data and send it off once it's built. This is a sampler, so you have to go collect samples. And, Oh, it probably is. I mean, probably more expensive. You have to have the, then you're basically incorporating the testing equipment there in the, I would have to look into that. I, I'm guessing that's what's going to be priced. That's, that's what I was looking at, something that we could just continually have a, a, a reading that's, all, that, that's there and you don't have to wait out in the water or have a boat. When yep. If Gregor Charles could, I'll get that to you, Mike. Okay. I'll send that to the committee. Yep. I'll find out what that would be and what that would cost and how that compares to the other stuff we talked about from the auto sample. Another question is on the when you mechanically dredge and you take up the, the spoils, I guess that's what we call it. Is it, can you tell, is it going to be consistent enough so that you could, you know, if we wanted to sell some of it to producers that wanted to put it on their land, are you going to know, I mean, do you say this is a range of what we found? Uh, because in order for you to guarantee that there's so much phosphorus or so much nitrogen in this, I mean, it, 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 by the time it gets picked up, put in a truck, and moved around, I mean, the, it, it could change because, you, as you said, it changes throughout the lake also. So how do you how do you merchandise something like this? Uh, can you just give me some ideas there? Sure. It, so the phosphorus levels don't change. Phosphorus doesn't go anywhere. Okay, unless it's unless it's in a soluble part of the water that escapes in some part of the process, the ph phosphorus that's in the spoil material isn't going anywhere. Um, that's going to be there. Is it consistent though? I it, it's it, I, I think it's consistent enough where I wouldn't call it inconsistent. It doesn't range from 200 to 1200, but it might range from 600 to 900. You know, and, and so we already typed up kind of a here's about what in the normal ag community at an application rate. Here's what it would be, and here's how many acres. We would need. And I don't. Did I send that to you, Nathan? Do you know? If you haven't seen that yet, it's in. It's in what's coming, um, and, and so we already kind of went through that. Uh, so, yeah. So we, we've got a grad student at Iowa State who actually that's what he does, uh, and so he already typed that up. That's already in the TM. So you'll get that answer if you want it now. I can send it to you tomorrow. But yes, it, it is consistent. It is. It, it were at the rate that it's applied and the rate of the phosphorus that's in it. Because remember. We're talking about rates the same as manure. And so when they spread manure, they spread it very thin. And so that means you get more yards. It takes a lot more acres to spread it across. Otherwise, you just got too high of phosphorus. And that, that would be the greatest thing is if there's a local staging area and you had other people who were dying for it and didn't want to pay, is it less expensive than someone to go out and spray an hydrus or whatever it is? You know, is it less expensive than, than normal fertilization? And can we make that make sense? I don't know. That's that's up to the ag community, probably. While we're in this inner phase of uh, deciding where we're going, um, you know, I've talked to the game fishing parks. Do you do you? What I want to do is make this a better fishery. So. They probably need to have lead time also. So, is there some things we should be talking to game fish and parks and saying, you know, to make this a better fishery, especially if we go to capping, there may be some things that we want to do to make it a, uh, a better fishery. Um, and uh, just so that they're on alert or who you need to be having a contact with, should, should we be doing something like that? Yeah, I, I, that's going to be important, no doubt, Mike. Uh, um, I, I don't know that I have time to do that between now and June 18th with what's in front of us, um, but uh, I think that that would be a logical next step is if you have a plan. I'm sure the first thing they're going to ask you is, 
okay, before we go do a bunch of work, are, are you committed to doing this project? And then yeah. they're going to say, well, then I want to know how much it costs. So I think there's a couple boxes we got to check. I think that's important, Mike. I think that we've got a couple more things, a couple more hurdles to jump over before we get to that point uh, where we're coordinating them. I'm sure that they would, my guess is working with other state agencies, that they're just going to, they're wanting, they're, before they put all the time in, they're going to want to know this commitment to move forward with the project. That would be my guess. And I'll be, I'll be happy to call them and ask them that same question. Um, hey, I'll visit with you, Buck. Fisheries is here June 9th. Pardon? Fisheries is here June 9th. I mean, yes. So we can have a, an initial informal discussion with them just saying this is what we're considering. And, and if that does happen, you know, does, does uh, fisheries have uh, ideas for us on how to improve this? You know, because how would you model a lake if you could start? Just before to introduce one new subject here before we close, um, is the bypass still in your thought pattern? Are you still thinking that may be an option down the road for uh, controlling runoff of phosphorus upstream? So, so th that's what I was talking about when I got to earlier about when, when Mark asked a question about the detention cell. Is that bypass? If, if we do find out that in the runoff hydrograph that we have a, especially at the up front would be the best. Uh, I'm thinking if we knew that we had one part of the hydrograph had higher phosphorus than the other where it may help justify that bypass. If, if all of the if all of the water coming down is the same concentration, then it's a volume problem and, and, and the bypass at the size that we propose at the cost we propose doesn't do a whole lot. So my thought is it would have to be almost done when you have the lake drained if you're going to do mechanical dredging. So it would have to be part of this project as well. But and, and that's what I said in that in that place. And because the other thing, you know, the, the other part of this project that we're going to look at theoretically is, you know, just qualitatively is, does it does it make sense to try and incorporate a low flow in the riser? You know, and some of the initial feedback I got was structurally that would probably scare some. You know, I don't. I'm not a structural engineer, and, and my, the best structural engineer I have designed like box culverts. This this is a specialty item, and if, if we if we put a drawdown in that existing spillway and modified it, you know, that's almost what would be required, I think, for that because otherwise, siphoning would significantly slow down the rate and therefore require even a bigger conduit size. So, that I think that's another part that about that bypass that's there that's kind of a technical hurdle is. Can we really tap into the riser? Or <clears throat> there's a project in Nevada, Iowa right now where they're actually jacking a pipe through a dam um, to, to lower, to, to create a drawdown, um, not using the existing spillway. And, and to be honest, I told them they're crazy doing that. They ought to just tap into the existing spillway. And, and I didn't win that job. So they're, they're getting ready to let that project, and they're going to they're gonna jack a pipe through the, job, through, the, through the dam and connect to that pipe. Um, so, but they're jacking a 14-inch pipe. We're talking about 48 inches. You know, it'd be, a, it'd be a monster project going through the dam. And I think it would scare a lot of people. Is going around it a possibility? And, and so if we go around it, then we know that we either, either A, have to do a lot of micro-tunneling to if, if it flowed by gravity. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're, we're, still, we're still running a siphon because we're going up and down. And so the problem with that siphon is we just, that flow rate goes down to maybe 10, 15%. No, I would think just going around um, with gravity. I mean, you could even dump into that same direct area by the spillway. Um, and so if we if we double, you know, and, and so right now just to get that pipe through the, just to get the pipe through the dam. I'm not that, talking through the dam. I, I know, but I, I'm saying just to get the pipe, I'm sorry, from the detention cell to the spillway was, you know, million dollars. Oh, right, right. Now I'm just now you have now you double that. I'm just thinking lower lake lowering level abilities right. going around the dam yep. versus having I agree I agree with you. And, and we're foreign that. Yep. Well not necessarily as part of this phase. Right. Uh, but that that was yeah. Whether or not that makes sense in the future. Mike, I got a question too. Uh, you you mentioned earlier about the new mechanical dredging. Kind of looking at your good possibility of it. You talk about zoning it. 
Is that how you would address the, the water issue problem for, for Pollock refinery? Yeah, that's certainly one answer to that is, is being able would to zone it. Some of the different alternatives you might propose for that? Well, it, it, all that really means is that we would be buffering the lake in ways where we could still create with a coffer dam some water that's there, and hopefully water that can be kind of drained in, directed their normal runoff to, to supply them with the water they need. And so knowing the rate that they need, um, and, and I need to speak with Becky about this, but knowing the rate that they need, you know, and the duration, we just got to look at the volume then and how, how much of the lake would it take. So that's that's on our list of things to do. I don't have an update on that today, but zoning is an option. So it's an option, sure. It, just how much does it cost and how does it affect the normal sequencing of the lake? Then? So the zoning costs uh, are associated with mechanical dredging. So when you do a comparison of uh, hydraulic dredging versus mechanical, then that would be in that comparison. Yeah, zoning. You have to consider the zone. If, if we're going to set up zoning to for the for, for poet or for any other use, yeah, that, that's that's part of the project. Um, we also have to consider, um, you know, seawalls and, and, and those kind of things. What, what what are we potentially talking about doing? Is that the is that the, the residents' personal responsibility to protect their own shoreline? If we, you know, the, the, the seawalls are the worst. Um, and and I'm gonna give a little bit of opinion here, not fact, but just so everybody understands, you know, when, when they build a seawall and you got land on one side and you got water on the other, everybody likes that nice clean edge. If you lower the lake too fast, then you have saturated soils behind the wall that tend to want to push it over because you don't have the water holding up sure. the seawall anymore. And so one of the problems is that usually those companies that do those, they, you know, they, they want to sell you their product, they want to do things as inexpensively as possible, they always design it at a full lake. Um, you know, if everybody had big shield sheet pile, we wouldn't worry about it. Uh, but they don't. Most of the time, you have a nice vinyl interlocking sheet pile that's pretty flimsy, but it works when the lake's full. So um, those could be expensive too. And so, how, how, you know, how do we factor that into the cost? Um, that's one of the things that we got to think about. So all, all of those things have to be part of that comparison. Okay. Just so I understand, how, how does the, the seawall situation? work? I mean, are all sea, well, I mean, let's just say you have uh, rock that's just at an angle. Mm -hmm. does, does, does that have an effect when you when you drain the lake? Does that? No. Okay, how about, we got a lot of city land that's got gabions or rocks in a basket. Does that then, do they have a tendency to want to, to fall? So, the, the steeper the slope, whether it's in a gabion or a, or a sheet pile, a vertical sheet pile, the steeper the slope, the worse it's going to be. I haven't seen the gabion design to see what kind of buttress it's sitting on. Um, the gabions also tend to drain things very well because they're very porous, where a seawall is more watertight. And, and so the, 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 the saturated soils behind it don't dissipate as quickly. And so if you think about it, in a mechanical dredging situation, if we get water in a lake, what's the first thing we want to do? We want to get it out of the lake as fast as possible so we can work again, right? Contractor wants that stuff gone tomorrow. So it can start drying out and he can start working again. And so that's the, so what we call rapid drawdown case is that's the most significant case is when it comes down. So stone, not a problem. Seawalls are going to be a problem. Everything in the middle, Mike, we have to look at. Cement, same, same problem if it's a cement seawall. If, if it's a cement one and it's deep enough and it's anchored and it's designed to, to work without water behind it, then that's great. Uh, those are pretty rare. You don't see a lot of steel. You don't see a lot of concrete. You see a lot of vinyl because it's cheap. And it works most of the time. I'd say on our lake, you probably see more rock than yeah. in general. I mean, you see some concrete, and that might be next. But there's not a lot of vinyl out there. There's maybe some. But there's, not a lot. there's some. And with the challenge of this also comes a lot of opportunity. So this is an opportunity if the lake was drained for homeowners to go out there and do a lot of things that they might want to do around their dock and around their shoreline that they haven't been able to do because there is water. Um, so there, there's opportunity uh, along with the, um, the challenges. So then next time you Are you then going to give us 
some options, or what what basically was supposed to come out of that uh, eighty thousand um, dollar so, compromise that was made that evening? Okay. So thanks for that question. I, I've got I've got at least three items I want to talk to before you kick me out of here, and that's one of them. Okay. So I, I want to talk about so. The deliverables are defined, I think, pretty well in the contract. You know, our job is to come up with what does the, you know, the, the main focus, the, the main question is, what's this dredging project really cost? So I'm going to be up here May 24th. We're going to be working on some of it, refining some of those things. At the same time, uh, Connor from my office is going to come up, and we're going to go back and do another dual beam bathymetry on the entire lake. Another one? Uh, the bathymetry, the, the sonar mapping. The dual beam maps the soft sediment. We've got some challenges with the geology of the lake, but a lot of the lake we could probably get a better answer on. So we want to get a better idea of some of the sediment depths everywhere, not just in those transects. It didn't work through the ice because the ice was too thick. We couldn't drill holes fast enough, and we had to drill three holes every spot to get that thing below the water. So it didn't go near as fast as we wanted to. So we're going to come up and map the lake again. And so, and so that that's another thing that we're. So the big thing for us is tie down quantities, tie down the process a price to it. That, that's the main deliverable here. So the, the specifics of that along with some of the questions that I was asked at the city council meeting that I tried to, to, to lay back in the task descriptions for this phase of the contract, POET was one of them, um, you know, uh, some of those other questions that we asked about, um, those are all spelled out. All those things are going to be spelled out. Uh, today Steve Rice brought up a thing that, you know, you might want to mention with regards to safety. If the lake's drained, what, do we have, what are some safety concerns, et cetera. I'll try to address as many of those as I have time for, you know, above and beyond what we talked about that night at the last city council meeting. But what I want to know from you is some thoughts, and I don't need an answer tonight, but what I want you to think about is, is that at the end of the first phase, we publish, you know, a draft TM. And so we can finalize that, or, and, and this can be an addendum to that, or this can be a standalone technical document. I, I want you to think about separate documents, you know, so I'm basically going to deliver you a written paper that, you know, writes down all these answers to the things we're discussing tonight and, and provide you with, you know, the sketches and the concept costs that here's, here's how we move forward. Um, and, and then it's, you know, going to be politically have to figure out what, what are the next steps. Is it affordable? Is, you know, is this something that we want to do as a community? And how do we do, what are the next steps? And so that, that that's ultimately what's going to be, Mike. So I could give you a kind of a standalone document on, on this phase of the project. I could add it as somehow add it as an addendum to the last TM and keep that thing as a working draft. We can finalize it and get everything buttoned up and sealed so there's a date on it. Or so like I guess I don't need an answer tonight, but I want you to think about that, okay? And, and how you'd like that document delivered. So, so that was one of the things there. Here, I get one second. I got these typed out here. The other thing I want to talk about is so spoil locations. So you know, we are responsible for defining a size and some concepts of what that would be. But, but I'm not going to start naming, you know, and at this point you really don't want to start naming, but we're, we're going to use his plot of land or we're going to use her plot of land here. You know, we're going to talk about size and, and what things may look like, but I want, you to, I want everybody to be clear here. I'm not going to go tell you that this is where you're going to spoil. There are other permitting considerations. But they do drive costs. And so one of the things we're going to do is we're going to talk about things as a range of costs. Look, if you can find something within two miles, this is likely the unit cost we're dealing with. If you got to find something eight miles away, then this is what it is. I'm going to comment on this just a little bit yeah. here, Mike. But it's not that my eyes have been closed to that issue because I have been looking, and we have looked at some sites. Yep. And I would say there's probably three, if not four, possibilities. But the difficult part of this is not knowing whether we're talking 500,000 cubic yep. yards or whether we're talking 2 million cubic yards. But, uh, and, and it's hard for me to, you know, to visualize that in my head exactly what kind of space that takes. Yes, sir. But I do have three or four different locations, at least three locations, that at some point I'd like to show you and have you look at it and see if you, before, again, I mean, there's, there's one that's city-owned property. So that's, that's just north of the lake. And I do realize that wherever we haul this at, uh, it has to be as close as possible to the lake as we can get it to keep the cost down. And so there is one there is one area north of uh, of uh, Lake Mitchell uh, within a 
that two mile range you're talking about without disclosing exactly what we're talking about. Then there's a couple other areas that I think are very good uh, areas too, but that's what I want to show you because I don't want to mention those locations because it does involve uh, some people that may be okay with it and may not be okay with it. But uh, before we even talk to those people, I need to show you those locations and see if you think that they are viable solutions for what we're talking about here. Yeah. I think the first thing is to know what the volume is that we're talking about. And so g given that we're planning on being back up here May 21st, I would tell you that I think that's going to be available right at the end of May 1st of June. That's our goal. Is to have Whenever it. you have time, I'll show you the locations that we've got in mind. And if anybody else in, in this room has any ideas right. uh, for locations that maybe we haven't looked at or haven't thought about, I'd like to know about it so we can pass that on to you. So so we should give some thought to that and talk about that a little bit in terms of the 24th and how specific, you know, you, you want to be um, on that. That, that. That's your decision. You know, we, it's, it's, you know, you're, you're talking, you, not this project, you talk about a landfill, and obviously you start talking about that, people start becoming real interested in where you want to put that thing, you know, and so. This is, this is not landfill. Right. <laughs> this is. And, and, and even mechanical, Mike, you, you, depending on, you know, you, you're going to be taking this thing out at different, you know, moisture levels. The, the stuff on the shoreline is probably going to be a little drier than the stuff right next to the channel. And so you, even in mechanical, you may have what we call a staging area where you want to dry it. Um, the, you've got to process it or, or, you know, bleed it out in the, in the, in the, the hydraulic, and, and you may want to dry it in the mechanical. So you may be dealing with that in both situations. So that, that's one of the things that we'll do is talk about what kind of areas are needed. Hey, we need 10 acres by the lake, and then we need 60 acres to store. You know, those are the kind of things we're going to come up with for you. I think that is for us is how long is it going to sit there? Because we're approaching the landowner, they're going to want to know how long am I expecting to have this, and what's the yep. plan with it moving forward? Because that, that, is, that can easily get to a point of saying that you wouldn't have it. If it's temporary versus permanent. Temporary or Anything that indicates how functional it is as a fertilizer? Yes. That, that's the same question I think that I heard earlier. And, and yeah. yeah, so we, what we did, Joe, is we looked at the, the P levels and then we compared that to normal ag additions, you know, manure application is, is basically the, the, the industry that, you know, developed the criteria for that. And so we'd said, okay, based upon that, Here's the tonnage per acre that we would recommend, and therefore, okay. here's how many acres you would need. Okay. So, yep, so I've got that. All right, thank you. If you want that for talking in the cafe, I can well, send it to you tomorrow, otherwise you know, I, it's going to be in the I think it's yeah. enough that uh, I can respond to the people who are asking me questions. Yes, sir. You know, and, uh, and that's... That it can be used? That it can be used? Yeah, oh, yeah, it can, yes. Okay. That, that's the short answer. It's, it's the same thing as manure without bacteria. Not with zero bacteria, without as much bacteria. So hauling manure is worse than this from a quality standpoint. So we've got, we've already calculated, based upon the, the concentration, I'll just consent to everybody. You can see the write-up already, that way you know what it is. All right, good. Yeah. yeah. So we had the, some questions that, that you all put together. And so there's one particular question that I want to talk about, but, but if you want to go through them all, then let's just go through them all real quick. That's up to you. Does anybody have any that, if you want to go through them all, you have a particular one you're not, that you want me to further explain my response? Otherwise, I want to talk to you about Mr. Donovan's idea of the performance-based contract. But if you want to go through them all, happy to go through them real quick. Why don't you hit the high note? Okay. Okay, and then if there's other questions that we want to specifically that someone's got follow-up questions on that they're not reading in here, they can we'll ask do. those. 
Okay, so the first com comment was from um, Becky about Poet and everything. So I think we talked about that a little bit tonight. I do understand the concerns. Talking to Steve Rice today, I, I maybe got a little bit enlightened. I need to schedule a meeting and a talk with Becky to figure out exactly what needs to happen there to make sure we want to know at this stage what am I capable of covering and, and, and what I'm not. So falls in my court to get a hold of Becky and, and, and work through all that. It was comment one, okay? There, there was the mention of a permit, and so I certainly, any Corps of Engineers and PDS type permits would be good for me to review and, and see what's there. Um, comment number two, Kyle made about, is Kyle here? Are you Kyle? Sorry, I didn't get a chance to meet you before the meeting. Welcome to our carnival. Um, disposal area, so anything, Kyle, that you brought up in that one that we haven't at least touched on a little bit tonight? Okay. Uh, so Jeff Vanderwilt talked a little bit about the dredging there. Um, I'd like Fire's opinion on the benefits of dredging Lake Midgeville and what are the risks. Um, so, so I know that some people in town have talked to South Dakota and then Iowa talked to George. Mike talked to George, I know, over at Iowa DNR. D dredging is not a, well, dredging by some is a kind of a blanket solution to things. What, what you'll hear is, is in fact, the project we're working on in Iowa right now, our project where they've been dredging, and basically they hired us to say, is, is this really doing anything anymore? So Storm Lake and Five Island Lake and Emmitsburg are two of the lakes that that's going on right now. Where we've basically gone in and said, dredging's not gonna do anything. And these are your goals, these are your problems. Dredging's not gonna get you there. You know, you got depth, you got volume, that's not your problem, here's your problem. Um, on the other hand, we're working on a project over in Davenport, Iowa, in the west part of the state where dredging was the solution and at Lake Manawa and Carter Lake, it was part of the solution. So dredging is not a blanket solution to anything, uh, and I certainly don't believe that, and it, it's very specific to every lake. Yeah, I, I can send you our deliverables for those projects and give you enough reading for the summer. That'll be but it, I think some of the nuances of it and when it's good and when it's bad, I think it'll make sense. Yeah. Yep, yeah, it, it's basically our, it's basically the same thing we delivered to you. It's a, it's a technical memorandum in which better management practices we felt applied to that lake and, and the dredging is addressed in every one of them. So yep, so I'll send you those. And, and Um, we have both, yep. All right. Comment number four. We don't want Mike to talk in public anymore. <laughs> I told uh, I told Mel Wilson today, I said, I got thick skin. I could take that stuff. Um, if, if there's certainly, is there anything that I can do personally to, uh, to address uh, these types of comments, uh, you, you can't step on my toes and you can't offend me by saying, hey, uh, take a little bit of a different approach here. Um, so just so you know, I, you can't offend me. Okay, so if, if there's certainly, if there's something I can do to, 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 to reach out to other people, but I, I can tell you that Sarah is, uh, you know, Sarah is very good at what she does, but, but Sarah is definitely not comfortable sitting here and answering the kind of questions across the board, uh, you know, that we get tonight. Plus she's an engineer, so. It's probably a lawyer making an engineer joke, right? Okay, so uh, comment number five from Steve. Um, so with that, I, I prepared some lengthy responses to these in part. But one of the things that came up in my conversations today with Steve Rice uh, and Mel Olson, I wanted to pass on to everybody there, is that one of the accusations that been, has been leveraged against us is that, and Steve Rice kind of said this pretty eloquently, was um, it, it seems to some of the public that FIRA created a model that only anticipates and analyzes FIRA's proposed plan, okay? And so my, my response to that would be, in the plan, we looked at all the better management practices for in-lake, near-lake, and watershed-based solutions that basically we use on every project and others use on every project. We don't, and, 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 our, and, and, and our model, understand that our model was built that takes many other models and builds them into one and combines other models. We did not invent any of these models. 
All we invented was, was the front end that pairs the information together, combines solutions, and applies risk and uncertainty to the answers. So the simple fact, and so what, what I tell people is, I cannot analyze solar bees. They don't have an application in the models that exist to anticipate lake response. It's a proprietary product that gets sold to you not using run-of-the-mill, everyday available models. Same thing with cactus extract, and same thing with lake savers. So if someone came in, came to me and said, I need you to analyze aeration, the model doesn't do that. What we can show and what we have shown is chemically why we don't think that that's a good idea at this time, but we've also said that that may be part of a future maintenance solution. But with it right now, with, it, with the response the lake bottom would have given the chemical makeup of the nutrients in the soil, we don't think that aeration is a good idea, okay? And we haven't even got to cost. You all are tough on me on technical backup and cost, but the other guys seem to be skirting around that right now. Uh, I, I think it's, I, I think, and I think the mayor and Nathan did a good job in the last couple weeks to say, hey, look, guys, ball's in your court. Give us some technical background. Give us some costs. If you want us to understand this at the same level that the information we're talking about tonight is presented, okay? So. I told Steve, I said, we can't analyze that. The only thing, if I took Lake Saver Solution and analyze it in our model, the only thing I do is say how much aluminum is in it. Because that's what our model is going to do. It's going to take the aluminum. That's how much phosphorus is going to be sequestered. And then we're going to gauge lake response based upon what's left over. That's the only thing I can do. The, the proprietary part of his product has to do with different enzymes and other naturally occurring processes, proposedly, that I don't understand, I don't know, and he's not willing to share because it's proprietary. So I can't model anything his product's going to do except for tell you how much aluminum phosphorus can be removed by the aluminum in his product. Does that make sense to everybody? So, so I'm going to address that again, but I, we cannot model these proprietary products that have something out there that's off the mainstream. And there's a reason there isn't a model that supports those. But I, I think the important thing there is to say, not only can we not model it, there's no other That's a good point. But, but, but anybody who tells you fire is only looking at fire solution, please have them reread the TM. I know how much fun that is. I've read it more than anybody. Reread the TM and look at the dozens of solutions we talked about. Did we model every single solution by itself? No. Some of you just write off because they don't make sense from a qualitative standpoint. It doesn't make sense to carry this alternative forward. And, and, and even at this time, you know, the, the solutions that we're talking about are the same solutions and the same mix of solutions that every lake in the country is talking about. This isn't a virus solution. It's, it's virus proposed mix of readily available better management practices that get us to lake response. This isn't a proprietary product. This isn't any, this is, you know, th 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 this is a mix of normal practices, test proven, project proven practices. And, there, and, and of course, everything in it is based upon scientific background and, and engineering background, okay? So that's one of the parts. The, the second part about the, the performance requirement in the contract there. So we've showed that, you know, chemically, we can get nutrients down to, to a certain level in the lake. What we can't control is weather and runoff and understanding that even if we get the internal loading down to zero, if it rains the next day, we got 560 parts per million in the lake if it rains this much. And we need to figure out what additional rains are going to do. Obviously, if we get a half inch, this is a huge flood. And I think I explained earlier, you know, that the volume of the lake turned over five times. And so this was really, that number that number's indicative of average watershed concentration. And if you look at where it plotted in the email I sent you on the scatter graph, it fell right in line with the other stuff. So, so it was nothing this graph right here. So it was nothing that was unexpected. It matched all of the other testing that we did for that size of event. And so that's pretty normal. What, what we don't understand is what we talked about earlier was does the average, and does the concentration change through the, 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 the runoff itself? So, so, you know, to sit there and say, you know, the, so I told Steve, that, that, I didn't tell Steve this, but I, I said, that would be like me saying, all right, I'm going to give $10,000 to Duckton Limited and I want you to build a pond. 
And if it doesn't have 20,000 ducks next year, I want you to promise you're going to give me my money back. You know, th there's so many things at work here. Who does that? You know, do, do, do lawyers return fees? Do doctors return fees if they didn't clean up your sinus infection the first time? We're, we're basing this upon all of the best information we have. We're doing the best job we can. No one in the world, it's not that we don't stand by our work. If we didn't do a good job, we wouldn't have happy clients. And I probably wouldn't have been around this long. But understanding that n nobody in the world is going to say, we'll give you this back. Now, you want me to double my fees and give you 50% back if it doesn't work? That's, what, that's what's happening in this other solution. It's real easy for me to double my fees and say, if it doesn't work, I'll just give you half the money back. And I think what we're looking at, though, you show here that the, the levels of phosphorus went back down right after the, after the big runoff event. So they do stabilize at a lower level. What we're looking at is those stabilized average numbers and if we get internal lake control, those stabilized average numbers on average should be lower. Right. So we're looking at some goal numbers that are measurable yes. and show improvement. That's what we're looking at. Yes, there are going to be times where you're going to have peaks. But your graph even shows that it goes back down to a more constant average. That constant average should be lower with internal controls, which we should get from dredging. That's correct. So that's what we're looking at is average numbers. And, and that's what the model spits out, and, and, that's, and, and you ask us what the goals are for each of these projects based upon the level of data that we had at the time. In, in the TM, you can look at pre-project, post-project. Post-project's your answer. That's what we're expecting. And nowhere on there did it say it's going to be 60 to 80 the whole time. It's impossible, and there are things we can do to reduce risk and try to get them as low as we can for when we want to use a lake. And there's a whole section in the TM that dealt with that. The bar graphs with the line graph going through it of the runoff, comparing, saying, we got to, if, if we, you know, we could hit that about that Memorial Day. And, and, and if it, you know, the, the weather looks good for two weeks, and, you know, typically once you get into mid June, you're, you're usually not dealing with a lot. With an inexpensive alum treatment, the internal load of control is under control. You do an inexpensive whole lake alum trip just to strip the water column. We're going to have a, a lake that's going to be in great shape throughout the recreation season or until the next big runoff comes. And, and that, that's, that, I think, is in my head, you know, what we're saying right now, that's the best plan for it until we can get to that next phase of continued watershed improvement and how much can that detention cell really do for us and help us manage out that number and smooth out. We want to get rid of them peaks and valleys, especially during the, the recreation season. We want to get rid of those. Any more questions on that? I'll move on. Okay. All right. Comment number six uh, from Mr. Kirkegaard. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, hydraulic and, and, and mechanical dredging, so I don't know if any more there we have to do. Okay. Comment number seven from Mark. Uh, what kind of impact for phosphor reduction we have? So that's one of the things that's on our plate that we need to deliver with this TM and, 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 and also more, more than very generally, as Mark said, is, is more about what, what's the design concepts, et cetera, that we can put good numbers to there. Um, lake solution allow for future lake lowering, so, so we are going to address that. Um, and I'm going to be working with people to see if they really think that that's feasible. Other than that, you know, we're using a combination of the work that SPN did, um, the report that they wrote. They did a great job of looking at all the existing facilities, how they can be used to lower the lake. Um, we're going to take that information, then apply it to statistics and say, what does that mean for us during construction season if we get a half inch or a half year, one year, two year, five year storm come through? What does that mean? And then how much downtime does that mean? How much the lake gets inundated? We're going to go through and, and kind of create some of that so that, so we understand before the 24th, so we understand a little bit better about how, how is that going to affect the processes, mechanical versus hydraulic or mixed. Uh, strategy of irrigation water pumping, so still working on that, as we told you there. Uh, kind of phosphorus. Okay, th this is a good question, Mark. Number five here. What kind of phosphorus reduction impact have other lakes had that mechanically dredged by percentage of total phosphorus? So we struggle to find history where the sole purpose of, so when we look at, at, when we look at Storm Lake, the purpose of dredging in Storm Lake was to reduce resuspension by wind and boats. 
storm lakes a 3,500 acre lake. They get huge boats on it, you know, that get that, that can draw reef suspension eight, nine, ten feet. They've dredged storm lake down to 16 foot. They didn't get a reduction in, in sediment reef suspension, and, and so they want to know why. And, and so the purpose of dredging at storm lake was different. The purpose of dredging at Lake Manawa was to create additional volume there to reduce nutrient because you have a, a very small lake. The lake to watershed ratio here is 527 to 1. At Manawa, it's 5 to 1 because it's an oxbow lake and it's not a dam. And so by dredging there, we get we doubled the volume of the lake that allowed us to reduce the nutrient concentration by half. Totally different purpose for dredging. Carter Lake, we did dredging for fish habitat. Here we're dredging to remove high phosphorus sediment that's been deposited in the lake. It's the only reason we're doing it, right? So, so it's a different purpose. And you're going to struggle to find projects where this was the sole purpose of what was done. A lot of times it's been mechanical. Um, and so we've struggled to find that answer, Mark. It's also going to be very specific to location, geographic location, soil types, et cetera. And so very difficult question, a good question, but a, a very difficult. I know you hate when I give you 10 reasons why I can't answer questions, but that's, those are some of the reasons why that's a very difficult question to ask. Answer. Okay, from Joe, comment number eight. Okay, so this had to do with the water supply, et cetera. Um, supplying water, so we're working on that. Performance guarantee number two, we talked about that, unless I missed anything, Joe. Well, I, I just want I just want to make clear, it's a performance guarantee that makes clear targets established by the city of Mitchell and agreed to by FIRA. You know, to me, that's where, you know, if we're saying, you know, with this work, this is what we expect, and you say, well, that's what we should achieve, then we should have some kind of yeah. You know, I, I, I guess I, I'm not a, oh, I've never thought that, uh, you know, we're going to have a lake that never experiences a high phosphorus count again. I've never thought that. I mean, that's, that's just not the way our system works. But I, I have thought that, you know, through our process, we should create a situation that shows improvement and, and we're allowed to have options on how to maintain that improvement. That's, you know, that's the part that, uh, and, and, and with those two actions, we should be able to maintain targeted goals. Right. This is my thought. And, and I agree with you 100%. The, the part I'm, the, the part that, that we came to talk about tonight is the performance guarantee part. Yeah, I, and I, I, you know, Steve got specific on, on dollars and what shouldn't happen if, you know, the guarantee isn't met. I, I guess that wasn't really what I was talking about here. Okay. You know, it's... Uh, just so there's some level of accountability that follows the completion of the project. And, and we, we have the deliverable, mm -hmm. deliverables and the scope for that, you know, and, and I think that, is that what you're... Well, I, I guess I, yeah. I I only go back on my experience, and in my experience, there's always, uh, there's always a, uh, uh, some type of a purchase agreement that went in place that said, you know, a deli a delivery of this, if not, then this has to happen, something like that. But I, I don't know what it would look like. I, I didn't mention anything about dollars. I, I guess that isn't what I was thinking about. I, what I was thinking about is if, if this, if, if we've got this investment, and uh, you know, this isn't, we're not able to do this. What do you guys can you help us with something here? You know, that's more. Well, what cer I think. Certainly, there, certainly, we ought to have a place of contingency plan. Yeah, yeah. And, and often contingency plans. All we can do is, is base everything upon you know, the best available data in terms of how we expect things to respond and, and use tried and true practices to, to make those estimates. And so, you know, ultimately we hope that, you know, we pointed this out, the, the modeling in, in terms of the, the, the residual phosphorus and, and chlorophyll levels don't indicate that after this project that the, the, the lake should be pristine by any means. But what we do know is that mathematically, they certainly return them to as good or better than when the project was originally built in 1927. And supposedly we had decades of good water there. So there's a disconnect there. Either people were more tolerant back then, or they just, you know, the algae, algal blooms were 
quick and not severe, and they lived with them, and they, and they moved on. I don't know. Um, all we can say is that you know everything we're proposing and we're backing up mathematically shows how that's going to work. You know, you hire a traffic engineer and you expect the traffic to flow, but sometimes there's some nuances of things that can't be anticipated by models or engineers, and things don't turn out perfect. So you go to a doctor for a sinus infection, and you know, so th th that's the part I want to understand is. Is I want you all to understand that there that there's no way that I can enter into a, any kind of agreement that says we're going to pay you two million dollars if we don't if it doesn't match the model, and that's the part that's a little unclear to me. That that seems to be what Steve is saying I should be doing, um, and, and then some of that got transferred into at least a couple different questions and uh, emails that I got here. So I I, I, I I want to leave here tonight knowing that we're all on the same page with that. That we're doing the best we can with the data available and, and, and using our expertise to predict what's going to happen. Is it going to be perfect? It's not going to be perfect. And Lord willing, it's better than, than, than we predicted. Um, you know, and, and the cost can be reduced, et cetera. And so in the last week or two, there's been a lot about this performance guarantee, and I just want to make sure I leave tonight and we're all on the same page about what that means. So in all contracts, we'll sign a performance and maintenance bond when, when they bid a contract, and the performance bond basically means that things are going to act the way they're supposed to. Of course, if they don't, you still have to prove negligence on behalf of the contractor. The contractor can build a sidewalk, and you get a seven-inch storm the next day, the sidewalk's gone. We can't say the contractor didn't do his job. Um, you know, so, so you still have the, the burden of proving negligence to that. But yeah, we, we define very specifically in terms of sediment volume, sediment type, et cetera, how that's going to work. And, and it's our job to come up with specifications that are stringent enough where we can say, did the contractor do their job? Yes. You know, we hired them to dispose of this many yards. Here's how we're going to measure it. You know, and, and, and that's our job to be your agent to make sure that they do their job on that stuff. Contractor's not going to be responsible for nutrient levels. You know, that's not their job. That, that's our job ahead of time to do the best we can to say, here's how this should work. But we all know that there's enough in science involved in this and science isn't quite as linear as engineering sometimes, where that number is going to be 100% right. But based upon calibrated models, so you've seen our models, you've seen how they're calibrated and validated, and based upon those things, we're confident in what we're telling you is, is the best path forward to, to achieve those numbers. I, I just throw in, you know, about phosphorus back in 27, and then it, it, it stayed good for years. Time changes. I mean, there wasn't much fertilizer going on the land back in 27, and a lot of the land around here was probably pasture. And we, through the, when prices of, of land or of crops went up, we plowed it up, and as we know, pasture absorbs water, and cropland sheds it, and along with it, we started in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, started putting on fertilizer. And we didn't put it right next to the seed like they're trying to do now. We broadcasted it. I was in that business. I know. And and so that probably enhanced the possibility of that uh, soluble phosphorus getting into our lake. You know, another hundred years from now, they may be that that may not be the case because they're going to have equipment that puts the stuff right next to the seed, and 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 they won't have as much runoff. But that requires seven five to seven hundred farmers as you were saying to invest in all new equipment and that's that's going to take a while before you can make that economically sound you know so i mean we're, we're going through some things that it might be as good as it was in 27 will it depreciate faster if we don't do the upstream stuff that's why i'm so big on this this holding pond we gotta we gotta somehow because getting conservation is going to take a month of sunday we got to make sure that retention pond up there is is going to have some way of, of stopping that phosphorus from getting to the lake. So. Yeah, it, uh, that's a great point, Mike. I think I agree with you 100% about uh, farming practices and, and more land is in in, in production. Um, we, we've also got more you know better farming practices in place yes. than, than we had in 27. We may have more farm ground being farmed, but we got 
better practices in place, and and uh, and, and we know that you know we're not we're, none of us are going to sit here and blame fertilizer uh, on the phosphorus problems. It, it, it's the soil, you know, and, and the same soil existed back then, and, and so that's all things being equal. It's not going to be exactly 27, but it should be close. And, and, and if we can do this project and reduce that internal loading down to less than what would be natural ground, and I just can't help but think we should be a little bit ahead of the game. But, but there's some, there is some risk in that answer and, and that assumption. We know that. We just don't have any way to disprove it today. So Joe made a comment, Becky did earlier in, in the thing about the, a clear plan to improve the water quality that comes into the Firestone watershed, you know, and, and that, of course, we've talked about how the watershed can be used to help reduce nutrients. A watershed management plan has not been developed. Uh, watershed management plans are pretty in-depth. They have, I'm sorry, as part of our efforts, watershed management plans have been developed by uh, the, the district, et cetera, and NRCS has some mini plans in there as well. So some of that stuff does, um, you know, until someone wants to revisit those, uh, it, it's my opinion that the, the watershed management plans that exist from St. James and, and uh, or James River and uh, NRCS would be the ones that we're following for now. Um, if someone wants us to do additional work as far as hotspot analysis and things beyond, beyond, above and beyond what we've already proposed to do some additional testing in the watershed, we're happy to do it and help them pare down the, you know, some of the locations. But for now, those are the watershed management plans that are in place that we're using and um, going about to try to improve the watershed. And we're going to add to those just a little bit with some of the testing that we proposed if, if you know, decide to do that. All right, schedule to work. Uh, Joe, with number four, were you talking about this particular or, or future? Uh, future. I, okay. A final design must include strategies that address our concerns. So I, I'm talking about a final design on these things, not necessarily what you know, now what you're going to talk about June 18th. Right. I, I know that's that's probably not realistic, so that isn't what I was talking about. But uh, when, at some point, if we can get to uh, reviewing a final design from FIRA, yep. uh, these were things that you know I was thinking I had to see in order before I could say that's an acceptable final design. That's what this list was about, and uh, maybe that's not what you were looking for when we were putting these questions together. But I know these were concerns of mine. And, uh, and and once again, I I know that it isn't the fun part of entering into contract with somebody, but uh, from my perspective as, as the customer, you know, I'm interested in some level of accountability of work that is said that will be done and at what level of quality it will be done. And so that accountability is really what I'm talking about if you re finish uh, reading that. Uh, you know, so it shows uh, results that are measurable and attainable. That was that was my. Okay, I didn't think so. That was my comment. Okay, <laughs> I didn't. I don't know who I just talked to. Okay, and, and and you talk about number five and, and, and number two are a little bit. Sounds like they're a little bit connected there, and so, um, yeah, I, you know, I. I'd be very interested in, in the committee's opinion on how, how do we term that in terms of my accountability. We've given you deliverables. And basically, what we've done, I guess, is we've promised you to give us, to give you and, and put down in paper our opinion. And, and that's really it. And, and so the accountability of an opinion, what does that mean? Ultimately, I think it's going to mean you made a good investment or you made a bad investment and you're going you're, you're gonna to continue to work with us or you're not. Well, I, think, I think what it means is... Uh, and once again, we're at final design. If ever we can get to that point, yeah. uh, then we're looking at the specific detailed uh, design of what is going to have to happen. Sure. And, and then there should be a, some level of uh, scheduling and accountability oh, that we yeah, can sure. apply to that. Yeah. You know, I, I think there's a, whole other, there's a whole other level. Just, just that we tried to do the best we could to define this next phase with some detailed tasks to make sure expectations and, and, and what we plan to deliver, we're on the same page there. I, I agree with you 100% okay. that in the future we would work on that too for the next. I guess I'm time. maybe I'm not uh, so much thinking about the immediate future with my questions here. Okay. That, uh, what might be down the road, we're hoping. Understood. Thank you, Joe. 
Okay. Um, so, number one, so Colin's comment number nine, number one, obviously, is I think that's what we'd all like to see. Um, th this deals with stuff that's outside of our uh, our scope here. In fact, uh, none of these comments, uh, besides number goal, number three, which was already addressed above the, the potential low flow gate and spillway there. Um, Brian Temple, so made the, looks like he was talking about the, the contract itself, and so. Um, okay, okay. Uh, capping remended, probable lifespan, yes, that'll be done. Um, examples of other dredging projects and uh, outcomes, so I, I, I made a note to send you some of, the, some of that information there. For those, Okay, the accountability, so Brian, are you, you, yours got a little bit more specific about some of those phosphorus goals, so based upon our, again, based upon our discussions tonight, anything else we want to revisit about those? Well, just recapping it one more time, I'm really fo focusing more on the short-term goal. We're not doing the dredging just to do a project. We're doing it to reach obtainable goals. So you're saying here, you know, the information we have is the average goals of the, we know that phosphorus is a problem. The average goals have been about 450 parts per billion of phosphorus in the Lake Mitchell. Last year was kind of an aberration. It was kind of out of mm -hmm. out of line. But on average, for the last 15 years, that's where it's been. And your numbers here for this year kind of show that same type of level so far, correct? I mean, your graph here is in that range. Yeah, so, so that graph was basically plugging... The inlet and the outlet and the phosphorus level. So, so that... No, that this is not a. No, th this is not a. Uh... Anyway, but the bottom line is, is what we're looking to do is get some measurables that we can compare to historically compare to see improvement on. If we do the dredging project, we want to see improvement. No, we're not going to get to sixty to eighty parts per billion because that would take a total uh, upstream and in lake solution. We're right. only dealing with the inlake solution yes. here. We're dealing with dredging. Right. But we should see improvement in the overall average phosphorus levels that are the problem that create algae, yes, sir. which should lead to less algal blooms, better lake water quality. Yes. So I'm thinking that you know if we do this inlake dredging project, we should expect in the next year or two to see this much improvement in what the average phosphorus levels would realistically be From the internal it. load, right. And my it, has, overall, it has no impact. Well, 50% of it's upstream, 50% is internal. We can control a fair amount of that internal. So we should expect maybe a 25% decrease in overall average or to up to 50. Yes. The overall averages are a function of, of runoff in the watershed and how much water is coming in to contribute to those overall averages, uh, obviously. So now, the hard said, thing said is a the couple short term because you, can't, you don't have the, the benefit of, of length to get an average. And the other harder thing about the short term is, is that even if we, as we've discussed, even if we knocked off 100% of the internal load, or knocked off 100% of the watershed load, without doing both, we still have levels that are capable of producing algal blooms and high right. oh, yeah. We're still going to have and, some. But if we go in and measure internal loading, you know, without a doubt, we expect that that internal loading is going to go down significantly, you know, significantly. So it would be nice to have ranges that say, okay, here's what your average has been. We expect to decrease it by this much, therefore your average should be this in this range for the next foreseeable Hundred percent. That's what the model's gonna tell us. Okay. That's what will be that's what will be reported as part of this. And we do we do have a model that you gave us. It's either in the TM, but I know because it's sitting right in my office, I look at it every day, that says if we just do the internal load control, this is how far down it goes. If we do both, it we'll get to this goal. And I have that, you know, it's either in the TM or, or I can at least get you a copy of that. But just for but, future for future on this graph, there's no water quality on this graph. This is just volume. The blue is the rate of runoff, and and the the black line is the cumulative volume. We just circled on the hydrograph where that sample was taken and what the sample was. So so this the, neither one of these lines compare to water quality levels. Just volume. They're, they're just Rate of rate of runoff and volume. That's it. Okay. So I just want to make sure that we weren't misreading that graph. You do have a concentration yield above 
We have the concentrations, yeah, we have the concentrations listed of the sample that was taken at that point, just to show on in the runoff where it was taken. Okay. One quick question this brings up. Now that you've got the core samples, has any of the 47% the, the that's in Lake and the 53% that, that's coming down, and we know those are, you know, can change with uh, elements of runoff and whatever. Has, has that changed? Because now you have a pretty good idea of what's, what's down there so far as phosphorus content because you yep. did the, are you, are, that would be the first part. The second part is are you going to take more samples or are you just doing a, a measurement of the bottom of the lake more than going down taking core? So first, answer the first question, Mike, is that um, we had, so we didn't see anything in the numbers that indicated there's going to be a significant change in that in that 4753 split. But we are looking at, based upon the method of binding of the phosphorus from calcium to ferric to ferrous, based upon the method of the binding, what the potential release loop rates are and how they may change from what we assumed before we have the data we have now, and that will be addressed in this. Okay? So you will address that if there's any change between 47 and 53? Yes, by yes. What's being released from, from on the bottom? From yes, sir. What you're seeing in the sediment? Yes, sir. Second part to your question is, is that we don't have any plans to do any additional sampling right now. We may do some after the project to, to confirm internal load reduction. What we're talking about doing on the 24th is just volume based. It's just looking for depths. Because as you know, we just did depths through the ice based upon sediment sampling in some locations. We're going to go out with the boat now and get a better answer across the entire lake so that we can tie down that volume, which is, which is obviously an important step of, of this part of the process. So, Mike, uh, it sounded like we were looking at doing some sampling to determine if the front part of the runoff is uh, front end loaded with uh, phosphorus. Yes. Are we doing that? Are we? We're not doing that. That that was that was the phase that was the section one services in that bigger contract okay. that we yeah. originally proposed. And so, the message I got from the city council time was, we're not going to do anything else until we tie down how much this dredging project. All right. All right. All right. You guys, you guys got call me calling internal uh, dredging project internal load control project right so so that was that was all spec'd out that was some of what Mike asked about earlier so so all that is laid out what we propose by the time that happened we probably missed this year as far as the season for that but but the real value of that information is paring down that 4753 number a little bit but more importantly it's it's in designing that detention cell and or a bypass that that's the real value of that information. So it, it's it's probably not you know the, the the worst thing in the world that it didn't get put in this one. It'd be nice to have it in place for next year. This is probably something that you know if we're interested in knowing that probably somebody would. You, you could certainly I, I think there's some some availability to help with that on, on behalf of and Dr. Mazur has expressed interest yeah. in some of our students help with that so. I think that's an opportunity. Again, what can the WAC be doing? That, that's something sure. they could certainly be doing. We, we respect all the equipment and everything, and they may need a little help setting some things up, but I think overall they're, they're capable of handling it. Okay, so so uh, Mrs. Olson made some comments. Final number 11 there. Number one, to get to the lake to acceptable phosphate level naturally. Um, naturally is the key word there. If that doesn't include the addition of chemicals, we're probably in a little bit of trouble, although they are naturally occurring chemicals, so I'm not sure what naturally means. Um, improve upstream habitat on the stream side. Um, certainly that, that's one of the things we talked about is once once we know if the project's moving forward, we do know that that's one of the things we have to look at is, is, is habitat within a lake and, and what can be done as part of this to do the best we can with enhancing that with adding you know X additional uh, costs. Uh, watershed inhabitants, what they can do, that education process, we've talked about that. Um, concerns, biological systems being disrupted if they're dredging. Yes, there are a lot of biological systems being disrupted. Hopefully most of those are systems that are not contributing to the lake at this point. Um, you know, lack of aquatic, significant aquatic vegetation, rough fish. There, there's not a whole lot of things that I think you would deem that's, that's something that's worth, um, you know, really preserving right now as far as high quality. Uh, Alamuse, high water pH is bizarre. a lot of money spent, continual basis, no real remedy, the overlying problem. That's that, you know, beat it at the source thing, and, and, and I agree 100% with that, and, and it's just one of those questions, again, of 
if we want to see improvements in this lifetime. How the lake be drained, uh, we talked about there's, there's multiple different uh, options there to be able to drain the lake, either looking at low level uh, modification of the riser to allow a level of drawdown or using the existing systems and or siphons pumps in place to do that. What to do with the fish? Uh, many are not river fish, we just die in the river. Um, that'll be a good question for the Department um, of Natural Resources and Fishery Management. Uh, uh, you know, we've harvested some of the fish, the rough fish, we've harvested and used them for fertilizer, we've harvested and thrown, thrown them in the, in the river uh, in the past. Um, there's probably, uh, you know, getting their opinion on what's worth saving and what isn't worth paying attention to is something ultimately it's going to have to happen. Um, I don't have the answer to that question today. Mark, would, if the start of this project was trying to protect all the carp, and I think probably someone talked talk them out of it. But um, Native American remains artifacts that they dredge. So that that's something that's going to have to happen. Um, this week, Dr. Mazur sent around a, uh, she had had a discussion, I think, with uh, the professor at Augustana about that. and some of their opinions of what was going to happen, but the, the, the environmental process ha is going to be a part of any project. I mean, every project by, by, by nature of having to work through, you know, waters of the United States uh, is going to have to confirm it with Corps of Engineers and the Corps of Engineers is going to require you to jump through those hoops. So going through that uh, NEPA process at whatever level is going to be required for anything um, that, that's done to the lake there. So that was the comments that were sent to me. So with that, I've got all my questions answered tonight. If there's any questions anybody else has or anybody in the audience has, I'd be happy to share my opinion. Anybody have a question? Yeah. Well, thank you, Mike. Yep. Thank you. It was the first sunny day I've ever been in Mitchell. It seems like I bring snow most times when I come up here. So it's it's nice to come up here and see stuff.